beginning at verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retained, they are retained. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I have something to say to you. And in my church they say, say on. If I don't have something to say, I don't want to say I have something to say to you. And if you don't have anything that you want to hear, then don't say, say on. But I have something to say to you. John chapter 20, Jesus' last breath. He had just revealed himself to Mary with his words when he simply called her by her name, Mary. And Mary responded by saying, Rabboni, my master, my teacher. That immediate response, just like Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And Mary, like any one of us would have wanted to do, wanted to embrace him, wanted to touch him. And Jesus immediately puts a halt on that and says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my God and to your God and to my Father and your Father. That's an awesome thing that Jesus can elevate. And this is really the first use of this kind of terminology in the Gospel of John where he's actually able to say to the saints that he's going to not only their God, but they're going to his Father. So therefore he's bringing them onto the same territory as himself and says, I'm going to my Father. When Moses died, remember, no one touched his body for burial, right? Only God himself buried Moses. When Jesus rises from the dead, he's not allowed to be touched. Mary couldn't touch the resurrection body because he was going to be taken up into heaven to go with God in his ascension. Moses, you know, gave instructions to Joshua, his successor, who received the charge from Moses and received the spirit. Like Moses had the spirit, Moses had to leave a successor who would lead the people of God on. Well, Jesus, we know, is described in the Gospel of John in many different ways and pictures as the new Moses. And so what he's doing here with the disciples, he's giving them a charge to fulfill what he left behind. He doesn't exactly lay his hands on them like Moses did, but he does something unique. He breathes on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in the upper discourse in chapters 13 to 16, but particular, particularly 14 to 16, where he's instructing them about his departure, and he says, I must go away. And if I don't go away, the Spirit can't come. But I'm going to send you another paraclete. Do you ever, I never noticed this till I preached through this chapter a long time ago. Jesus says, I'm going to leave another paraclete. What does that suggest? That Jesus is the first paraclete, and the Holy Spirit is the second paraclete. So the substitute for Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to do what Jesus did, guided them, instruct them, and taught them. But Jesus' ministry to them was limited. He says, I have many things to say to you, but I can't say them right now because you're not able to take it in. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will what? He's told to be a comforter, an instructor, a teacher, a guide, a leader. Is that what Jesus is fulfilling here in the 20th chapter when he breathes on them and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit? Is this a Johannine Pentecost? 
We heard about Pentecost last night in Acts chapter 2. Well, we don't have, like the, the synoptic writers had, Luke write the book of Acts, which is a fitting sequel to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But for John, we don't have an Acts of John. What took place after Jesus' resurrection? What does this giving of the Holy Spirit suggest? How do we compare that to Pentecost? Well, some have said that John chapter 20, when he breathes on them, that he, this is a sprinkling. Whereas in Acts chapter 2, it's a saturation. But one thing for sure, I feel confident about this, that what's taking place here in John chapter 20 is not the fulfillment of what Jesus said in the upper discourse in chapters 14 to 16. Because here, the Holy Spirit is not given for the purpose to instruct them, teach them, lead them, guide them, and so on, but rather there is an evangelistic thrust in the, in the giving of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And I don't think that the, that the importance here is not so much of what the disciples are receiving as much as it, as it is, is what the Lord Jesus Christ is giving. In the Gospel of John, we have Jesus portrayed as the new Moses. He's the greater than Abraham. But he's also the second Adam. The first Adam, we know from 1 Corinthians 15 and from the account of his creation itself, is that Adam received life from God. God breathed to him the breath of life, and Adam, man, became a living being. We can't help but see the similarity here in the breathing when Jesus breathed on them. But here, the breath is now coming from the second Adam, the Lord from heaven. Jesus is the life-giving spirit. Adam received life. Jesus is giving life. In John 7, he describes himself and what he's going to give to his disciples that out of their innermost parts shall flow rivers of living water. Well, on this occasion, when he meets with his disciples, when they're in this closed environment, the doors are shut, the windows are shut, John makes a specific point about how they were securely locked in and suddenly Jesus appears in their midst. Obviously, Jesus took on some extraordinary body property powers that he did not have before. Jesus is described as having a glorified body. Surely he walked on waters. He disappears or at least escapes out of the midst at times. He multiplies loaves. He stills the waters. There's no doubt that Jesus is the divine human being, a divine being, man and God, in one person. But here we find, just like the way he came out of the tomb, John makes an important reference to that, how Christ comes out and the disciples, as you know, they rush to the tomb. They see that the clothes are lying there. And the headpiece was folded up separately from the, the strips of grave clothes that were on his body. When you think of Lazarus, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. The one who was the resurrection and the life could say, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth bound hand and foot. Someone said, good thing that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he said just come forth, all the graves would, would have been opened. Because Jesus says the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That day is coming that not only sheep will hear his voice, but all mankind will hear his voice, and they will be raised from the dead, and they will have to stand before this thrice holy God. He's the life-giving spirit. Jesus had told his disciples in the upper room, greater works than these shall you do, 
because I go to my father. That's a very puzzling text, don't you think? How is it possible that Jesus' followers, disciples, fallen sinners, yes, saved, but they're going to be doing greater works than Jesus did? How could that be? Remember when Elijah was about to be taken up, and he says, what do you want me to do, Elisha, for you? And Elisha said, give me a double portion. And as he was caught up in the chariot of fires, what happened? The mantle of Elijah falls on Elisha, and he takes that mantle, wraps it up, he goes to the river, he smacks it against the water, and he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah in the water separated? He receives the double portion. I think the disciples are receiving the double portion. Greater works than these shall you do because I'm going to my Father. What would those greater works be? I think Jesus is suggesting right here what they will be as they're commissioned to go out. In John 17, Jesus' prayer to the Father was, Father, as you have sent me into the world, even so send I them into the world. Well, right here is that great commission of going into all the world. So this is John's great commission. And we'll refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke's commissioning of the disciples before Jesus' departure from the earth. But I want to say a little more about Jesus' breathing on them this supernatural Holy Spirit life that energizes them to be able to do and say things that are going to create amazing results. I had said that Mary Magdalene touched the Lord or tried to touch the Lord, and Jesus said, no, I have not yet gone to my Father. Well, Jesus shortly after that appears to the disciples in the upper room. When was the last time the disciples saw Christ? when he was being captured by the soldiers in the temple police in the garden, and the disciples were there. And Judas Iscariot was leading them to, to Jesus. And Jesus innocently, naively says, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And what did he say? I am. And suddenly, suddenly, they went back. They were coming to touch him, to grab him, to, to apprehend him, to handcuff him, so to speak. There was the warrant out for his arrest. They're going to imprison him. But as soon as he says, I am, they went backwards and fell to the ground. They're about to steady the Ark of the Covenant. In, but God's breach of judgment falls. The nables are trying to capture David's greater son not realizing that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The bones of the dead men were touching the resurrection and the life. They were coming out to see the one whose glory was above the brightness of the noonday sun, and they were knocked to the ground. It says they went backwards, and they fell to the ground. I don't think it was a backwards this way. I think it was a backwards this way humbly acknowledging involuntarily that Jesus Christ is Lord. They, like John in Revelation 1.17, when seeing the great I Am, they fell at his feet as dead men. They came to the hill of God, and they saw Jesus of Nazareth transfigured into another man. That's right. This is John's transfiguration. We have the synoptic description of the transfiguration, but here we have John's description of a transfiguration. Now, we don't have details of exactly what took place, but something majestic, some divine issue of an energetic life from Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, emanated from him, and it drove them back, and they fell to the ground. You know, Jewish tradition says that when Moses pronounced to Pharaoh the name of God, that he went backwards. That would be very interesting if that's true. When Jesus answers them, I am, the Shekinah glory of the burning bush was blazing 
in their presence. Do they know who they're in contact with? Take off the shoes from off your feet, for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. You're seeking of Jesus of Nazareth? Do you know what manner of man is this? Never man spoke like this man. This man could stop the seas and the winds. Jesus of Nazareth, is, Jesus of Nazareth isn't who they think he is. He's the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. The lid of the ark was opened. The rod was lifted. And the men went backwards like the walls of the Red Sea. The hem of his garment was being touched. And power went out from him. Power is going out from him. The strong man's cords were loosed. And the spirit was mighty in display. The rock is being spoken to in an unsanctified manner. And the floods of water flow out against the adversaries. I know by looking at the majority of you, you grew up like I did, remembering the Superman series that was on television, black and white, back in the 50s, right, brothers? You remember when Clark Kent, the news reporter, goes into the booth? He's dressed up just like Bill Sasser, you know, got the three-piece suit on, looking sharp as anything. He goes into the booth, no one sees him, he shuts the door, and what does he do? He takes off that garment and he comes out blazing with these superhuman powers. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was, so to speak, unbuttoning the outward veil, removing it temporarily, and they saw that blaze of glory and they went backwards. Brothers and sisters, what, kind, what manner of man is this? Amen. This is the Son of God. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is the one that dwells in the light that no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see. They went backwards and fell to the ground. This is the one that is breathing on them the breath of life. The life giver is now going to install with his followers, his disciples, an ability that was far beyond anything that they ever had. This is their going out into all the world. He charges them and says to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. This is John's version of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Mark 16, 15, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, 46 to 8, Jesus says to them, it behooved Christ to suffer and that he should rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things. That helps us get a grasp of what is the what is going to be the content of gospel preaching? Let's ask that subtle question, is there an implication that there's a necessity for the law to be preached in the gospel? That's the overhanging question we're kind of posing tonight. And as we go through some of the passages of Scripture, you can decide for yourself after what we're going to listen to. Well, we're going to go to the sequel, and that is in the book of Acts, chapter 2. You don't have to turn to it. I know you know these. I'm going to go through the book of Acts real quickly. If we want to know how gospel preaching is done, how, to, how does God save sinners, how can, justi how can God justify a man, how can he who was born unclean be made clean, it's the gospel. 
after Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, exalts the worthy name of the Lord Jesus. He says that God hath raised him from, a de from the dead. He's exalted him. He's made him Lord. He made him Christ. And you are the betrayers and the murderers. And after they hear this, they, they were pierced in their heart, and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are the first words that comes out of Peter's mouth? What did Jesus say in Luke 24? What was the instruction? That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name. Repent, Acts 2.38. And be converted. Repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says. Repent ye therefore. Let me get that exactly, get that exactly right. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is, repentance and forgiveness of sins mentioned in the same expression that Peter gives in response to their request, what must we do? In the third chapter, again, there's a large audience that has come together when they saw that this crippled man who sat at the gate a beautiful, who was begging alms daily, finally was walking and leaping and praising God. And they looked at Peter and John, and Peter said, what, why look ye on us as though we through our own power or holiness made this man strong? But no, this man, through faith in him and the faith that is from him, has made him whole. And then he goes on to say, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out in the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. And I personally am convinced that the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord occurs when a person repents and turns to the Lord. And then their eyes are open, they're enlightened, they see, they understand, and that refreshment comes immediately upon them from the Lord himself. In the fifth chapter, the God of our Father hath raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. There it is again, repentance and forgiveness of sins. In the 8th chapter, when Philip goes down to Samaria, it says, They believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, both men and women. Have we seen any law preaching here yet? Are they not fulfilling the Great Commission, what Jesus told them to preach and what to say, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in my name? In that same 8th chapter where the Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his chariot and reading out loud, which was a common thing for Jews to do in those days, he was reading out loud, and the Spirit had bade Philip to go and join himself to the chariot, and he asked the question, do you understand what you're reading? How can I accept some man should guide me? And beginning at the same scripture, what did he do? He preached Christ unto them. Christ unto him. Wow, that's that message. In the ninth chapter, verse 20, after Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is converted in the road to Damascus, it says, after Ananias came, and he went out, and it says that he preached Christ in the synagogues. Christ in the synagogues. The tenth chapter, I love this chapter, where Cornelius calls for Peter. Peter comes in reluctantly. And as soon as he sees Peter, he falls down before him. And Peter says, stand up, for I'm only a man. But he perceived that God was no respecter of persons. Then he began to preach unto the, to them and said in verse 43, to him, who's him? Christ, give all the prophets witness. That whoever believes in him shall receive what? Remission of sins. And while Peter spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them which heard the word. To him give all the prophets witness. That whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. That's the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. 
Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's exactly what was going on. In the 13th chapter, Paul says to the Jews in the synagogue, verse 38 and 9, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In the 14th chapter, Paul again, and was it Barnabas was with him at this point, they go and it says that they so spoke that multitudes believed. That's all it says, they so spoke. What does that mean? How can we not preach the gospel without passion in what we're preaching? It says, so spoke. What is that? They weren't just lecturing. They weren't just giving instructions. They were preaching fervently. That's what we ought to do when we present the gospel. Fervency. Fervently. In the 16th chapter, the Philippian jailer thinks that he's going to lose his job after the earthquake and all the inmates are gone. Prior to that, remember, Paul and Silas were singing songs of praise to the Lord at midnight. And here they are, they're tortured, they're fatigued, they're beaten to a pulp, and they're still praising the Lord with songs. Boy, that's a good example to us, isn't it? Of learning whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He had certainly learned things to be able to praise the Lord under those conditions. Wow. Well, obviously, in those prayers, uh, praises rather, in their singing, there must have been something in the lyrics that triggered the reality and the necessity for salvation. Because he rushes in with a light, trembling, and says to the apostles, what must I do to be saved? Well, we, we got we to give you a class on the law. That the law, you've got to be brought under the law first. You've got to, you've got to feel the conviction. You've got to know that you're a sinner. Believe, we, we believe all that, but what, what's the response? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Remember, we're going back to John for a minute. Remember, Jesus breathes on them. He says, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But they're not going out just solely with the word. They're going out with the power of the Holy Spirit. In John 16 and 8, Jesus says, when he has come, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Were they not Holy Spirit preaching here in the book of Acts? Look at the results that was occurring. This is where we get our clues. This is where we get our instruction on how the gospel is to be preached. In the 17th chapter, he reasons with them out of the scriptures that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And then in the 30th verse and 31st verse of that chapter, to those who are on Mars Hill, he says to them, God now commands all men everywhere to what? Repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And it says, some believed and some believed not. Paul says, we endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, 2 Timothy 2.10. Like in Acts 13, 48, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's the good news for us who want to evangelize and spread the message. Praise God that there are fish in the waters that can be fished out. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to call my sheep by name. Father, I'm going to have you send them like you sent me. And they're going to go into the world and say, your sins can be remitted. If you refuse this gospel, your sins will be retained. I was preaching one time in the open air, and a, an old lady came up, and she started yelling at me. Yelling at me. What is all this about? Why are you making all this noise? People don't want to hear you. What are you doing this preaching stuff? I says, ma'am, Jesus says, it, rather in the Bible it says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
I said, that's why I'm out here, because faith comes by hearing. And how are they going to hear unless someone's sent? There's a necessity for us to spread the gospel. And you yourself, you need to hear that message and repent yourself. Well, I could tell you lots of stories about the open-air evangelism experiences over the years, but I'll leave that for another occasion. In the 18th chapter, when Paul is preaching, he says, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Believing. Believing what? The gospel that Paul preached. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's enough in gospel preaching. Is that being heard today? Is that what these pulpits around the country are propagating? In the 26th chapter when the Lord Jesus, and this is Paul's personal commission, Jesus says, now I do send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And Paul goes on to say, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first that they should repent and do works worthy of repentance. In the 28th chapter, and this is how the book of Acts ends, Paul faithfully right to the end of this recorded history, it says he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, no one forbidding him. There's the record. That's the fulfillment of the commission from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the record of what they carried out from Christ's commissioning of them. The founder of the Salvation Army, around the turn of the 19th century, was interviewed. And he was asked the question, what problems do you think we're going to be facing as we enter into the next 100 years? And his response was this, what concerns me is that we will have religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without hell. Those concerns are on our doorsteps now. Truth is fallen in the streets. The darkness is darker than ever. It says in Exodus 10, 21, the land will be covered with a darkness so thick that you can feel it. And don't you get that feeling, brothers, how dark the darkness is becoming? It's almost like a satanic invasion. It's like Revelation uh, 20, the enclosing of the saints that are sort of being trapped by the demons coming out with Satan out of the abyss, deceiving in ways that were unknown previously. The darkness is darker than ever. But the good news is that in the midst of this darkness, God's grace can burst bigger and true believers in Jesus can shine brighter. We should be able to sing, Oh, beautiful for patriot deep dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam, undimmed by human hearts. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy brood with fortitude, with the words that I inserted there, from sea to shining sea. I'm not expecting that God is going to give common grace, that we're, they're going to be able to universally be able to shine, but to the brood, to the ones that the Lord Jesus has brought to himself, we're the ones that are commissioned now. You and I are to be the spokesmen. You will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Am I ready to be a witness at all times? Paul says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. 
how vital that is that we fulfill that commission. When Paul went and preached to the Galatians, he said that you receive me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. What amazes me in the book of Ephesians, we're in that second chapter, a great chapter of the Bible. The middle wall is partition is broken down by who? By the Lord Jesus. And he's brought, made peace between what was previously opponents, the Jews and the Gentiles. They're now one new man, one new creation. And it says, and came and preached peace to you who were far off and to them that were near. Now wait a minute. We're not Mormons. We don't believe that Jesus has visited these different countries like America. They don't have the right Jesus anyway, but you've got my point. How can it be said that he came and preached peace to you? You who? You Ephesians. You're, you're far away from Jerusalem. You're far away from the, the tomb where Jesus was risen. You know, Saul went to the witch of Endor to raise up Samuel from the dead. But Samuel's not going anywhere. Jesus, though, is going places in you and I. Jesus said in Luke 10, 16, He that heareth you heareth me. He that despiseth you despiseth me. And he that despiseth me despises him that sent me. Do we realize what we've been entrusted with? We are the bearers of the gospel. Someone said there's three ways that we can witness. By our life, by our lips, and by leaflets. Tracts, gospel literature that we can hand out. Is it true that now we're in days where religion is without the Holy Spirit? Christianity is without Christ. There's forgiveness without repentance. There's salvation without regeneration. Politics without God and heaven without hell. That's a very sad picture. But that seems to be pretty accurate in describing the days that we're in. We have many a shallow ground Christian. They have a name, but not a birth certificate. They've been baptized in water, but not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have a Bible, but they never read it. I got a call about a week and a half ago. Uh, a couple's been coming to the church lately in the last several months. And he called up and he said, Pastor, do you think you could uh, come over and visit me? He's, I said, what's the problem? He says, well, I'm, I'm having some problem with anger. Okay, yeah, that's a legitimate concern. So I said, okay, uh, how about 6.30 tonight? Would that be all right? Your wife will be home then? Yeah, sure. I'll tell her and she won't have a problem you coming over. That'll be great. So I went over. One of the first things I said to him, his name was Brian. I said, Brian, are you reading your Bible? And he said, well, um, no, not really. You know, and it made me right off the bat think, is this a child of God? So what you've been coming to church? So what your wife's a Christian and a Christ-devoted person? What about you? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That is the fruit that a Christian will be demonstrating is a hunger for the word of God. David says, uh, Jeremiah says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah 15, 16. David said in Psalm 19, 10, that the words of the Lord were like honey. He desired them more than honey in the honeycomb. That's what the scriptures should be to a child of God. They have a Bible, but they never read it. They have a profession, but not a possession. They have a religion, but not a relationship. Brothers and sisters, are these true statements? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? They have a church, but not a conversion. They have an ear, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. They call Jesus Lord, but they don't obey his commandments. They have a song but not a new song. They say, Lord, have mercy on me, but they don't say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. They call Jesus their Savior, but not their Lord. They have the form, but not the power. I had religion for many years 
in my teenage years, I fasted, I prayed, I went to church, I made the sign of the cross, I did what the church, the Orthodox church that I grew up in, what it prescribed pretty much. I had the religion, but I didn't have the relationship. I had the form, but I didn't have the power. The scripture describes Christian as that we are more than overcomers through him that loved us. We're more than conquerors. This is the kind of power that the gospel has. It doesn't just justify us, but it as well sanctifies us. And the many that are thinking themselves to be justified, but there's no sanctification in their life. They go together, don't they? One produces the other. If you're justified, sanctification is going to be right on the doorsteps. And you're going to begin to see what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. Take the world, but give me Jesus. That's what the hymn writer said. That's what we say. And we say, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. We want to give God the glory. We want to praise him. One of my favorite preachers of all times is George Whitfield. He happened to come in, in my town, my area where, where I'm from, preached on what was called the Worcester Common then and now where I have preached. I've gone to the, some of the historic spots where he preached, a, a place called the Whitfield Rock. I think if you go on YouTube, you might... I did a, a, a gospel preaching right there on that rock, and I also gave a little biographical sketch of Whitfield, if you'd like to, to look that up. I think we can really pay tribute to a brother like that who God anointed and raised up, one who, like John Wesley too, don't want to uh, ignore him. These men of God were willing and faithful to take the gospel out of the, the, the sanctuaries and bring it out on the streets. After all, Jesus does say, go into all the world. Our gospel is only going into the church buildings. We're thinking that they're going to come to us. That's unlikely, and more and more unlikely. We have on our church sign out in the front, just the name of our church is Sovereign Grace Chapel, and underneath it, I have the words, where the Bible speaks. And underneath that, it's, it reads like this. We ought to obey God rather than men. And we see the forces of man's word that's starting to drown out God's word. There are more atheists today than there ever has been. This country is flourishing with atheists, and the college campuses are breeding them and feeding them. And it just gives them more license for more licentious lifestyles so that they can practice their sexual immoralities freely, they can somehow dull in their consciences, they can kick the Bible under the bus, but nevertheless, the gospel is still going to shine in the glorious way that God intends it to. When Whitfield was about to have a series of gospel meetings in this particular location. There was a group of men in a tavern. They were drinking. They were sort of just hooping it up. And one of them decided he was going to imitate Whitfield. So he went to the tavern in innkeeper there and he asked him if uh, he had a Bible. And he got the Bible and he went up and he got on a table and he stood up and he just randomly opened the Bible. He turned to, it turned out to be Luke 13, 3. He read these words to try to imitate Whitfield. He read the words. Those words. Those words. He opened the word of God and read out of Luke 13 in verse 3. All the eyes were upon him. Jesus had in that chapter, as you know, described about Pilate taking the blood of the Galileans and about the Tower of Siloam fell. And, and he read the scripture that you too, unless you repent, and he's reading this, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And as he read this out loud, 
amazing work of God took place immediately in his soul. He was stunned. The scriptures convicted him of his sins, of his unrighteousness, and of judgment to come. He looked at the crowd, and he made a beeline out the door, ran into a room, fell on his knees, and cried out to God, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I repent of my sins. I'm a guilty man before a holy God. And immediately the Lord had mercy and saved him. That's the power of the gospel. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit and said that whoever sins you remit, now, that's not just for the clergy. You know, the, the, the Roman Catholics and the high churches, they would try to take this and talk about a apostolic succession so that only the Episcopalians, the Roman Catholics, through the bishops laying on of the hands of successors, they have this ability to be able to absolve people of their sins or to repay, uh, retain people's sins. And they try to link that to, to Matthew 16, where uh, Jesus says that... Uh, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's not the right parallel. That's incorrect. And I'm not going to go into all, all the details about that. But the good news for you and I is that we can lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're told to do. We don't have to preach the law. And I'm not saying that there's no place for the law. I will say something about that if I get to speak another time. But for tonight, I'm going to say the essence of the preaching is obviously located in the scriptures themselves for us who want to know how do we communicate salvation to people? What is the message that we bring? Paul summarizes it in Acts 20:21. 20, he says, testifying to both the Jews and the Gentiles, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the summary of the gospel. Repentance towards God in faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist preached the first words, will repent for the kingdom of God is near at hand. And Jesus sends out his disciples and tells them as he sends them out by two and two to tell men to repent. That word seems to be like a, a far off term these days. Calling a sinner to repent, calling a sinner a sinner is sinful to them because it just ruins their self-esteem when they're classified as a sinner. That's an archaic term. That doesn't belong in our modern vocabulary. Oh, well, preach the word anyway. When I was in uh, college, I went to a Jesuit-run uh, Catholic liberal arts college, and um, God in his mercy saved me on, in my last semester of my senior year in college. I had intentions when I graduated, me and the captain of the football team, we were going to go down to uh, Cape Cod and hoop it up for months down there, party time, and then go to Florida for six months over the winter. And then we were going to head to Australia where he had us lined up. That was back in the 70s, 20 bucks an hour working construction. Here we are, college graduates from a four-year college going out. And, anyway, so th those were the plans. Just a week, a week away from going to go down to the Cape, where we're going to look for a, a place to stay, rent a cottage or whatever for the summer, God had other plans. He saved me on February 1st of 1975, the night that I had plans to go out partying and drinking with the boys and the ladies, and we went to a, a place that was actually called the Last Chance Saloon. I went there, and that was my last chance there. I just, God changed my heart and changed my life. Well, here I am, still a college student. I had been a theology major, believe it or not. I went, as a, I went as a jock, basically. I was an athlete, football and baseball scholarship type of guy, and uh, that's what I was there for. It was just sports. I was going to play for the New England Patriots or the Boston Red Sox or something or other. You know, I had these dreams like every other kid did. Well, I, I never, neither played for either team, uh, never got drafted or anything of that sort. But anyway, that's what I thought I was going to do. Or the coaches will take care of me when I got out of college or, or something or other. It'll all work out, I thought. Well, God had other plans. He saved me. Well, anyway, I took all these religious courses, and part of the reason was because everybody knew that that was the easiest major to have in the college was to take the religious studies department, 
But I had other motives too. I did want to learn more about God. I was searching. I was reading the Bible on my own. I would go on, on trips with the football team, baseball team. I would bring my good news from modern man. Remember that little paperback? That's what I was reading at the time. Didn't know better. That's what was uh, available and handy, and I'm reading the scriptures. Well, eventually, in God's mercy, he saved me. And I'm in the class, and many of my classes had Jesuit professors. And one of the professors I had had in two or three classes previously. And in the class that I was in, and I'm just saved, just maybe two or three weeks at the most, the professor, and he was up on a stage like this. We call the classroom the pit because it was a stage where the, where the, uh, the priest, the Jesuit, would uh, lecture from, and all the uh, students were down in what they called the pit in, the, in, the, uh, in their seats. And he's going back and forth, he's lecturing, and in the course of his lecture, now this was a religious studies class, I can't remember the specific name, but he said, somewhere in the Bible, he says, somewhere in the Bible, it says that, that Jesus became sin for us. He says, for the life of me, I, I can't understand how that Jesus, uh, so holy and so perfect, could be made sin. And he kept, he kept lecturing, walking back and forth. But when he said, I don't understand how Jesus could be made sin, and I've just saved about three weeks, I shot my hand up in the classroom. And he's walking like this, and he sees, he says, what do you want, Gary? I said, can we just back up about a minute or so of what you just said? How that somewhere in the Bible it says that God made Jesus or, or that Jesus became sin for us? I said, I want to quote you out of the Bible, the verses. Listen, everybody. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And I said, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. I said, he never sinned. He did no sin. He knew no sin. But God the Father took sins of ours, placed them on his son, and his son on those hours of the cross is where he took our sins in his own body on the tree. And there was silence in the classroom. And he looked at me and he said, don't talk the rest of the school year. <laughs> Everybody broke out and laughed. Because he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. And when I got converted, my parents, and my, my parents' home was only like four miles from the campus. Even though I lived on the campus, I planned to turn the home when they were going down to Florida into a crusade location. So I got all these paper, wrote all these invitations out. I was giving them to everybody that under the sun in this college handing them out to the Jesuits. I got the, uh, the assistant chaplain to come. I got that priest, Father Donnelly. He came out that night too. My wife, who was a nightclub singer, just got saved. She's singing for the Lord now. She actually had to leave a little early to, to you know, get to her uh, nightclub singing. She was just really newly saved, just gotten the sanctification, just starting to work in her. Plus, she was under, under contract, so it made it a little more difficult. Nevertheless, he got to hear 70, 70 people came out over the three nights, jammed in in my parents' downstairs basement that I turned into a gospel hall. I had my brother-in-law put all these, make all these gospel texts out uh, on beautiful posters. We posted them all up. I went and borrowed a lectern from the place that I used to work, and I had a, a, a former drunk who was a bartender in one of the worst places in the city who got converted, I said, Dawn, I want you to tell your testimony. Michelle, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, I want you to sing. Let's get somebody in here to preach the gospel so we can tell the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord and that if they repent and if they trust Jesus Christ, we have the power to be able to, like Jesus said, whoever sins, you remit, they are remitted, and whosoever sins, you retain, they are retained. That's what we've been entrusted with, brothers and sisters. We are the ones upon whom Christ has breathed as well. That breath is a whole breath for the whole history of the Christian church. So we have been all made evangelistic. Not all evangelists necessarily, but we all can be evangelistically minded. So may the Lord help us to be encouraged by what we have heard and read tonight, 
in what Jesus, the life giver, gave to his own in his last breath upon his disciple before departing this world, commissioning them, commissioning us to be able to go out with confidence that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Amen.